Hello, I'm Bill Curtis, inviting you to watch the Philippe Matthews Show. Welcome to the Philippe Matthews Show at the PMShow.tv. Named the Oprah of the Internet by Mark Victor Hansen, Philippe Matthews doesn't ask questions that are different. He simply asks questions that make a difference. The Philippe Matthews Show features entertainers, bestsellers, authors, thought leaders, change agents, and world-class experts in the field of personal, spiritual, and professional development. An Internet marketing entrepreneur, Philippe is the creator of the How Movement, dedicated to teaching people how to move from the mindset of hope to the process of how. If you are ready to take your life to the next level, move from the mindset of why to the mindset of why not. Tune in right now to this latest edition of the Philippe Matthews Show and watch your life grow. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen, with another brilliant mind uh, on the Philippe Matthews Show. We have Dr. Luann Brizadine, a uh, best-selling author of uh, two phenomenal books. Uh, one, of course, you know, it's called The Female Brain, and the other is called The Male Brain. Uh, and she is on the phone with me right now, calling in from the luscious San Francisco spot. Uh, how are you, Doc? Just fine. Things are good up here at uh, UCSF in San Francisco today. We've got uh, nice, nice weather for a change. Fantastic. Well, every time I come to San, uh, San Francisco, seemingly it's always nice weather. I don't know why. I always miss the bad weather. Seemingly. I don't know what that is. You must have a lucky star. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were born, are you from Sausalito, or what part of uh, San Francisco are you from? You know, I was born in Kentucky. Well, excuse me. <laughs> in Hazard, I was born in Hazard, Kentucky. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a Midwesterner like you from the beginning. Oh. Can't my folks hail from Kansas City, Des Moines, and, uh, and Kentucky, so kind of that Midwestern swat there. All right, fantastic. So you uh, moved to the West Coast uh, for school. Right. Yeah, my, my, my father was a Protestant preacher, so we moved around a lot. Oh, wow. Now, this is interesting. Is this true where you originally uh, uh, went to Berkeley uh, with the idea that you were going to be an architect? Yes, actually. I spent my first two years at UC Berkeley in, in um, architecture school drafting, et cetera, and then I gradually decided I didn't, there were only two women in my class in those days of about a couple hundred, so it wasn't exactly a welcoming welcoming place for women in those days, <laughs> and I, I, my idea was I wanted to design environments for people, uh, houses and things that would maximize their creativity, which was like my 18-year-old idea of what I wanted to do, and I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize that I wanted to help design it from the inside out and the brain. So I got interested in neurobiology and hormones and behavior since lots of my professors at UC Berkeley in those days were they were the greats and uh, founders of the whole field of of hormones and behavior. They were doing lots mm -hmm. of work on sexual drive and testosterone in those days, which was known but hadn't really been worked out uh, quite as well. And looking at things like that, hormone oxytocin that's not oxycontin it's oxytocin <laughs> that's right there you go and it's called the love hormone and the cuddle hormones it's released when you cuddle or when you give a massage or you get a massage also it's released in males and female brains at, at orgasm nice so that nice. was all being discovered there and somehow i thought that was a pretty interesting compelling uh uh, career to go into studying you think. the brain, the brain, <laughs> brain and hormones and sex behavior. What else is more interesting at the age of eighteen, nineteen, twenty? Absolutely, you tell it on yourself, Doc. You tell it on yourself. <laughs> now, <laughs> that was during the feminist movement too. So I was also <laughs> I was also a feminist, you know, and participating in that whole movement at UC Berkeley. So. Uh, that's why I've, I've gotten a lot of grief for writing this book, The Female Brain, because lots, sure lots, yeah, lots, lots of feminists, that. lots of feminists feel that it's anti-feminist, which I disagree with. But there you have it. Now you, now you know all. I know all, uh, and, and I feel great about it. And, and here's the thing: you graduated from UC Berkeley in neurobiology. You went to Yale uh, in, in medicine and uh, Harvard Medical School in psychiatry. Right. Uh, Mike, aren't you tired? 
<laughs> you know how it is. You never sort of look at look. If, you, if we any of us knew what our life was going to be like at eighteen, nineteen for the next twenty years, we'd think, "Oh my God, that's too hard. I wouldn't do that." You know, you just you just play it day by day, year by year. You know, you don't kind of look for. It. But yeah, so UC Berkeley, then then Yale, and then Harvard, and I stayed on faculty there at, in Boston or Harvard for um, uh, a, a bunch of years after I finished there before I got recruited out here to University of California, San Francisco. And I founded a clinic here in, in UCSF called the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic. Oh, fantastic. We're going to talk about that as well. What I want to talk about is uh, really your journey, uh, not just as uh, you know a noted doctor, but uh, also as a celebrity. I mean, you, you know, Pain is something that you really can't predict and you, you know, sometimes don't even know how to manage it and handle it. But I want to know how your female brain changed <laughs> as, as you began to ascend uh, in, in, in becoming your own. And, I mean, you know, going from, you know, a student and then, you know, the next thing you know, you're, you know, years later, you're on Oprah. I mean, that's a big deal, and a best-selling author. Right. Well, it's, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, being going from being a doctor and a professor running a clinic to being in the middle of, um, you know, a big media storm and having the book published, uh, translated in that now into 29 languages. So oh, my gosh. It went viral worldwide. So that, that was a bit, it was, it was, it took me out of my comfort zone, shall we say. <laughs> Absolutely. I felt like I was drinking out of a fire hose every day. <laughs> you know, for the for the first two years that it all went viral. So you you know, it's like you're it's you're not prepared, but it's like a lot of things in life, it's like ready or not, here you are. Sure, sure, absolutely. My goodness. So let's talk about the differences a little bit between the male and female brain. Out of all of this that you discovered, what were what were some of the aha moments that you? I mean, we we all know some of the things that are normal. You know, okay, men like to you know you know we like to look at women and, and chase skirts. Okay, that's you know that's kind of and men, women are a little bit more cerebral and, and 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 intuitive. Those are some of the the generalities that we all know of. What did you discover? that was like, wow, I didn't see that coming. Well, you know, I think what was so fascinating to me is, you know, at the moment of conception, you know, we either get an XX or an XY. So you guys have the XY and we, we gals have the double, what's called the double X. But then at eight weeks of fetal life, the tiny testicles in the male start pumping out huge amounts of testosterone that marinates the brain and changes it into the male brain. So that by the time we're all born, we have a male brain or a female brain. But in that male brain, all that testosterone marination causes an area in the hypothalamus to grow to be 2.5 times larger than in the female. And you know what that area is called? It's called the area for sexual pursuit. Oh, yeah, okay. So, Fascinating. That was very, I mean, so that Mother Nature made it so you guys have a much larger area with more cells wiring your brain to sexually pursue fertile females. And fertile females are females that have large breasts, small waists, and plump hips because estrogen is the thing that makes the female body have those curves and the breast tissue. So that male brain, you guys are actually wired for that. And between the ages of 9 and 15 in the boy, the testosterone level climbs 250% by the time he's 15. And that runs those circuits to make his brain and eyes and visual part of his brain track fertile females. So looking at the female figure. That is amazing. And, and I could see how you got in trouble. <laughs> and started the controversy of that. It's like, oh, my gosh, you know, we're trying to be equal here, and clearly, biologically, hormonally, we're not. Yeah, so, I, so basically, I, I, saying, saying the biological truth, um, and then that's not politically correct, uh, those, two <laughs> things, those two things hit a collision, I will tell you. Well, what's fascinating is, um, is, your desire to study the brain from the hormonal perspective and the behavioral perspective, where did that come from? Uh, how did that begin? Because there's many areas uh, uh, of neurobiology you could study, but you chose the hormonal aspect. Why is that? 
so, you know, I got very interested back at UC Berkeley as an undergraduate in this phenomenon. One of my professors named Frank Beach, who basically ran the whole, the whole, it was called the Beagle Dog Lab because they, they were studying sexual, <laughs> sexual behaviors in beagles. And he had this whole lab up in the Berkeley Hills. It was his scientific lab and looking at how um, different hormones affected the both the female and male um, canine sexual behavior. So that was that was that was fascinating. And then years later, though, when I was at Yale Medical School and I got interested in the field of psychiatry because um, females have a two to one ratio of more depression than men and more anxiety. And I thought, gosh, that's that's a dirty trick. <laughs> that, that was mm-hmm. so very unfair. Mm-hmm. And I thought. Gosh, and it, but the thing is, is that that double the rate of depression doesn't start because in childhood between males and females it's a one to one ratio, and then not till the, between the ages of twelve and fifteen years old does that change to the two to one in females. I thought, well, what what happens at that age? Well, for one thing, I, the menstrual cycle starts at age twelve in girls, mm-hmm. so that change there in the huge huge tsunami of estrogen that she's putting out in her ovaries and uh, gosh you know the hormonal effect on the female brain may be part of what is making this happen and remember the mental cycle has high waves of estrogen and then they plummet down towards the end of the cycle and then you know the two or three days before ovulation the females have a big burst of this May, not some people call it the male hormone testosterone that makes her flirtatious and horny about two days before ovulation. So I thought, wow, mm. something is going on here that m- makes all of this actually affect us females. We already we already sort of knew what was going on with the males, but <laughs> <laughs> so I got fascinated in this, and and that's when I ended up over the next um, decade in 1994. I founded a clinic called the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic that actually helps women during different times, either their menstrual cycle or after they have babies or in that period of 10 years that goes up to the perimenopause, menopause. A lot of women get lots of mood problems. So we know how to mm-hmm. fix and we know how to fix that now. So it's all wow. it's all based on this, you know, about ten percent of women have really bad PMS and the cup the couples the the couples that come into my office, the guy comes in and he's really baffled. He doesn't know he doesn't know where he stands from day to day, <laughs> the poor sucker. <laughs> and so what I have the couple do is I have so he has a job, he has an assignment, he has a three by five card and if it's an argument that happens three or four days before her period starts in the middle of the PMS, he is supposed to write down what the topic of the argument's about, and they're not to argue, they're to put that card in the drawer, and then a week later, when she's back at her best, they are to pull the card out and have a discussion about whatever that issue was. But his job is not to, there's no use arguing at that time, it just, two people are not their best, it only, it only, you know, forebodes bad, bad things in the relationship. So that's mm-hmm. what the, so fixing the relationship is something I do a lot and help educate the couple on, you know, how to be their best in their relationship. I find it fascinating because you're doing it literally from the inside out, from the brain as opposed to just the psychological aspect. You're dealing with the, 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 the biological aspect of it, of relationship. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, it feels like it just, just it just gives me extra tools in my toolbox to help people, and to help people be their best individually, but to be the best in their relationships too. Because relationships are really hard; they're really the hardest thing that human beings do. This is true. This is very true. So, uh, with the uh, women's mood and hormone clinic, uh, I, obviously you would uh, help women not just uh, going through uh, their period, but also I would assume uh, menopause as well. Yeah, so going through that age like 42 to 52, that that big 10-year ten, ten journey <laughs> that a lot of women know about. And, you know, women between 42 and 52, they, we're not done. We're, we're still at kind of at, we're at our best. We have a lot of wisdom by that time. And so just helping that, the, the ovaries start to do what's called sputter. They start sputtering a bit in that period of 10-year run-up to the, to the menopause before they finally retire. <laughs> 
The average age <laughs> is 51, 51 and a half in the United States of um, menopause. So that's when the ovaries retire on average. Some women are like two or three years before. Some women are two or three years after. But that's that's how the buildup goes. And so how to um, keep the fluctuations from doing havoc on her sleep, on her mood, on her anxiety. Mm-hmm. And a lot of women come in at that time of their life, and there's a 13-fold increase in anxiety and depression in women in those 10 years leading up to the menopause that they never had before. So the women are thinking, there's nothing really wrong with my life. You know, I've got great kids. I've got a great husband. I, we have, we, you know, we have enough. We're doing fine. Um, there's no reason for me to be feeling like this. So then we start to look at the hormonal aspect and put her back in balance. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. You know, something that uh, I, I've really been longing to ask you when, when I had you on on, on the uh, on, on the show uh, is is dealing with how how do men and women deal with, uh, or how do their hormones, I should say, deal with the fluctuations and differences in their environment, and and how much does um, one's environment uh, affect them hormonally or vice versa. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? So give me an example. So an example would be um, someone who, you know, a, a boy or a girl who are, is born into poverty. Uh, and what does that role play hormonally in terms of how do they handle this does the lack of having uh, opportunity affect the brain hormonally. So you're pointing to a really, really cool area now of research in in neuroscience and brain and hormone science, actually. And um, one of the fascinating things that happens, let's take the girls first. So born into a situation of either adversity or being being born in America in a in a community where there's poverty there's there's constant drug dealing there's there's danger from being killed by stray bullets you know whatever the situation is mm-hmm. being robbed being raped um you know it's being in basically a war zone all the time mm-hmm. and never knowing whether you're safe and never knowing where whether your bills are going to get paid that whole that experience in childhood even though parents in the in those situations try their best often to protect their children from uh, the effects of it that's that's impossible to do the kids the interesting thing the girls so the girls it really affects their brain and their hormones that we know of in the following way in many more ways than this but this thing we know for sure is that they because of that get stimulated in their brain to go into puberty sooner fascinating now that would seem to be bad news for those girls in a lot of ways, mm-hmm, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, if you start your period at 9, 9 and a half, 10, you, you, you know, you're fully developed breasts by the time you're 10 and a half, 11, which a lot of girls in that community, there's a group of them that are, that would seem to be bad for them. But what happens to the brain is when it gets all the stress from that kind of almost living in a war zone, mm-hmm. Mother Nature made it so you would try to quickly become fertile so that you can procreate quickly before you get killed. Wow. So this is really a basic fight and flight with fun. You've got that, and and it stimulates the brain to go into puberty earlier. Fascinating. And it has the opposite effect in the boys for some reason. It sometimes delays puberty in the boys. So the stress reaction in the female brain versus the stress reaction in the male brain is quite different. And scientists are fascinated by this species, and lots of research is going on in this area. There's a very, very um, cool piece of um, this, a lot of this is coming out of Montreal, out of out of Canada, out of a fellow named Michael Meany's work for about the last 15 years. But what they've discovered is that girls that have been really kind of grown up in in, in abject poverty, but also in very stressful poverty situations. 
they can they if they get some kind of a situation where there's increased safety and increased someone that is a safe person that they can relate to, say like a social worker at the school in a lounge or something that's always open that the girls can go to, a lot of some of the traumas they experience in childhood can can basically kind of rescue some of their hormones and brain circuits. And the, the the hypothesis is it can help them not go into puberty so quickly. Wow! So, so the hormonal so can be reversed. A little bit. There is a point where it can be reversed. Yes, yeah, so that's exciting to me because yeah. that to me what that means is that if we were you know we've taken away the the funding in schools for nurses to be at the school or for you know music teachers or for all kinds of things that were places and we don't forget having like a social worker or a lounge where just the girls can go hang out in the junior high years say in mm-hmm. grade grades 5 through the biggest biggest bang for your buck for intervention would be grades 5 through 8 if you had that kind of a place where you had a very maternal kind of social worker in the in a girls lounge just at any school could really be useful to a lot of those in a biological hormonal and a brain circuit sense so is there a point um, uh, of no return? Uh, I hate to ask that question. But is there a point where the environment or the damage done by the environment uh, neurologically where those fight and flight uh, processes are just so, you know, the stress, the stress is so great that the brain permanently changes? You know, the brain is what we call, you know, the concept of plasticity. The word plastic sounds like maybe something that's a hard plastic, but in the concept in brain science is it's kind of like molten plastic. You know, it can form into other shapes, and then you can heat it up, and it can form into others. So that concept in brain science is basically very new and has been able to show that it's never too late. To rehabilitate the brain, the hormones, the body, the mind, is possible at all ages, even into old age. So even though you had traumas and grew up in an adverse environment early in life, that does not mean that you cannot reform new brain circuits to take over from those old. Wow, now that's exciting. It's very exciting, and it also it speaks, you know, it means that at any point that 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 someone is able to intervene in a helpful way for a person who had lots of early trauma, early abuse, early neglect, grew up in a impoverished environment where where basically they, you know, that you know, they had nothing but uh drug dealers and and guns and whatever around they these things can be reformed in the brain you can go back to school you can have some therapy you can have you know there are lots and lots of things for new experiences that can help rewire the brain in a positive way that can ameliorate or reduce the the negative effects of that early impoverished environment well now here's the here's i guess the next uh, logical uh question and that is for those who are uh you know newly experiencing poverty or financial struggle for the first time due to this new economy that we're in uh you know let's call it you know call it the ninety nine percent uh people who've got everything right now they've lost their home they you know they can't find a job uh and so there's a new level of stress that they thought they would never have to experience again. How are they affected hormonally? How is the brain affected hormonally by both men and women? Uh, in, in with this this new level of of life stress. Well, one of the things is that happens in all of us. Let's say that it's a person who you know they'd already grown up, done their education, gotten whatever job they have, whatever mm-hmm. whatever, and, and things have, they have a major reversal. They lost their home and they're they're back to they feel like they're back to square one. So let's take that individual. That person had already let's let's take a man for example, and let's say that he, whatever job he had had was something that he was you know that he basically he brought home a regular paycheck, he paid whatever bills he could pay, and and he felt like he had an identity as a you know as he had something in the world. Mm-hmm. 
and that was his identities, who he was, who he had become. Oh. And all of a sudden, that's ripped away. The rug is pulled out from under him. And all of a sudden, it's he's he's feeling not only he's feeling baffled and all of a sudden his identity is who he who he is as a person has changed not just not just the stress of the circumstances of how he's going to make ends meet but but who he is comes into question as well so it's a it is a major shock to the entire system mm. a major stress reaction to the entire system in a person that is in that kind of situation. So it's it's basically a um, ongoing stress and shock to both the brain and the person's identity. So again, though, that is something that can be rehabilitated, or or, or is there a certain uh, point of age that it, it becomes more difficult? Well, it's always difficult no matter when something like that happens, but the good news is is that, yes, the rehabilitation, that the, the person's circumstances as they change for the better can basically help them reestablish who they were. And the person in general, when you have a period of adversity and as you climb back out of that adversity, that experience of adversity actually people will look back and they will tell you I'm sure you've interviewed someone in your program. They will tell you that it's made them a better person. Mm-hmm. So Is it what, almost like? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Bob. Our brain. What our brain does with adversity or with with bad experiences, you know, once we've already formed our identity as as an adult, mm-hmm. is that we find a way to incorporate those those adverse experiences. And to re- reweave those into our identity and be- and basically learn from them. The brain is the, the human brain is the most most complex, fastest learning machine that we know. It's the best mm-hmm. learning machine there is. And humans will learn from their adverse experiences and take it and make a better brain out of it. Incredible. You know, it, it reminds me uh, of. of you know how the white shells, uh, uh, you know, protect the body and take a foreign, uh, you know, inv- invasion and mimic it, and then create an antibody to protect us against it. I mean, it seems like the brain, psychologically and even neurobiology, neurobiologically, does the same thing. Exactly, it does. It basically adverse experiences the the brain. The whole brain circuit tries starts to figure it out and figure out how to prevent and counteract having it any of that ever affect it again so it's really almost like the brain cell is the brain cells are a whole immune system unto their own you're exactly right you know, that is absolutely fascinating to me um so so uh, so you know learn helplessness that whole the whole whole uh, uh, uh part of psychology of, of of you know being defeated so many times, failing so many times that you just lose the impetus to try again. Uh, that connected to the environment, uh, either when you're a child or when you're an adult, that can be overwritten. That can be that can be changed. That is. That's yeah, you basically just take this the, the DVD and you just push the rewrite button and you start <laughs> working it over again. <laughs> And that the concept of learned helplessness and, and uh, depression and losing your motivation, that's kind of a natural response to all of us. We kind of feel like, oh, gosh, you know, why should we even try, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we, we talk to ourselves that way. But pretty soon other things will kick in. And, you know, you basically start to realize, oh, if I think down that pathway, it leads to nowhere good. Mm-hmm, I, I need mm-hmm. to not allow my brain to go down that pathway. I need to cut it off as a path and just make it go down a different pathway. Uh, incredible. So how can people get in contact with you, Doc? Uh, we, I've got more questions, but I want to just pause for the call to to find out how can people get in contact with your website and your thing. Yeah, if they just, if they just Googled the female brain, Dr. Luann, the female brain, Dr. Luann, they'll go. That'll take them straight to my website and to all of the information and all the things at UCSF and everything. So it's it's Dr. Luann, author of the female brain. 
fantastic. All right, so let's talk about um, uh, the drive to succeed, uh, which both men and women have. But I, 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 would you would you suggest that they they handle that or go for it differently? Uh, the drive to succeed and earn money. So I think that one of the things that every every culture has. Um, has a set of values that says, okay, this is what men do to be successful and this is what women do to be successful. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. there is a, a piece of the culture that creates the gender um, objectives. And for mm-hmm. men, for men, it's always been in all cultures, the man is supposed to collect resources. And that could be money and status and power. I mean, if a man collects resources, then females actually will choose to mate with males with more resources, even if they're not as good looking. They'll, they'll choose that. The men do the opposite. They'll That's blatantly that. obvious in the in the world too. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's this is just biologically it's it's biologically written, but we also all of us know it just from observation. So, the male drive to collect resources is also his way of attracting mates. And um, that's that, that. That men in power will tell you that one of the nicest things about being a man in power is that they have women throwing themselves at them all the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that was every teenage boy's dream, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, you know that. So that that that's a pretty clear pathway from for the motivation that's that's got to do with procreation for men is that the way to attract mates is to get resources and power. Now, for females, it's a more complicated thing these days because that motivation in that direction is not it, – she's not going to – power and money and resources for a female um, doesn't attract the mates that she wants. It may attract a lot of suitors, but it may not attract the mates that she had in mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. Different. Okay. So it's different. It's a big – that is a big difference in the arena of – of, of of jobs and money and power and collecting resources. Um, females, basically, one of the, in all cultures, you know, there's a lot of blame to the media for making it so that, you know, females want to look this way or look that way or be skinny or be whatever it is. And the and yeah, wear this and wear that and carry these purses or this these shoes. Or, in every culture, though, you think about it, Let's think. Let's take us some primitive cultures. You know the ones where they the, the women will put stretch their earlobes or stretch their necks or their lips. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now in those cultures, the the little girls nine, ten, eleven years old, they cannot wait to be able to do that because in their culture, that's what's beautiful. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. to be able to become beautiful, it means that's the way you attract mates. That's the way you attract males in that culture is by adorning yourself in some kind of way or changing your body shape in some kind of way that attracts males. So in every culture, females want, one of their big motivations and drives is to be as attractive as possible. Think about the fashion and cosmetic industry. I mean, it basically, it lives on that. But my point is, my point is, those industries don't create the motivation. The motivation is in us biologically. Wow. The female brain is wired to want to be attractive to males and to pull male attention to her. So you can see how these line up. And these are not absolute hard written gender. Uh, it's not that every woman, every man does this to the nth degree. But this is just part of how our biological brains and hormones are wired for the for the for the mating game that Mother Nature. You know, this is how it. This is how the rules of the game are played. Now, what's interesting is is that uh, this obviously is you know the the, the heart. Uh, uh, of uh, neurobiology and science. Uh, however, there you know there there are brains that uh, uh, I don't know if I would use the term just you know get discombobulated. You know there there are, are are men who are more in touch with their feminine side, and then there are women who are more in touch with their 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 male side. Uh, is that how how does that play out hormonally? And then. Uh, uh, there, there's the whole uh, uh, issue of homosexuality, and uh, where does that stem from? And is there a, a hormonal, biological link to that versus just 
uh, a, a behavioral link to that. Uh, so you agree, I, you bring up a really important whole area. So so it, if the, if you guys wanted to read the if the men wanted to read the cliff notes to the female brain, they can just go to page thirty nine in the page thirty nine in the female brain, and they'll get all they need. And that's kind of the average typical female heterosexual brain. So we're talking about in that area. And in the male brain, the women can just turn to page thirty three and get all they need to know about the average typical heterosexual male. Now okay. that's so 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 let's 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 for the moment leave behind that the average typical uh straight male and female and let's go to people that are same sex attracted. And I go I, I both in both of the books um I have written everything that we know biologically about the gay male brain is in Appendix 1, and everything we know about the gay female brain or the female brain and sexual orientation is in also Appendix 1. So I mm-hmm. wanted to lay, and it's a very easy read. You don't need to have any any um, science background to, to read this. Mm-hmm. But no, also, I'll just give it to you in a nutshell, though, because what we do know now, scientists know, um, that, that, that the biology and the wiring of the brain, by the time we're born, your brain is either wired to be same-sex attracted or opposite-sex attracted. By and, the time we're born. Yeah, by the time we're born. I mean, that's, it's already in. It's already in the circuits. Obviously, it's not. It doesn't sort of express itself until puberty. So wow. the, at the same time as as heterosexual males are starting to look at female figures and shapes for fer- searching out fertile females, and they're getting they're getting that that they're going that direction. That that's that they're attracted sexually to the opposite sex. Same sex attracted boys and girls are starting to have that romantic and sexual attraction to same sex. Um, and we know that this is also all, all kind of embedded in the brain circuits. We know that it's probably it's probably genetic. It's probably how how the brain circuits are formed. But some very interesting studies um, that are out of Sweden have been able to show that males. Did a study where they took straight guys and gay guys, and they had them smell the pheromone. A pheromone is what's called an airborne hormone. It's not like it's not bo. It's not like sweat, but it does come as a as a subtle, hardly noticeable scent from our sweat glands. Mm-hmm. That, that that so that straight guys are repelled by the pheromones from male sweat glands, but very attracted. To the pheromones from female sweat glands. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, gay guys are very—they're sort of disgusted by the pheromones from female sweat glands, but they're very sexually attracted to those from male sweat glands. Fascinating. Okay. And the the nice thing about looking at that is that these 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 tests—they don't even know that what they're being tested for, and they're scanning their brains in the brain scanner to look at the whole circuitry for attraction. So it's almost like reading the reading the brain circuits or reading the mind based on these pheromones. So it's a very biologically, uh, it's a biological natural state for gay brains to be same-sex attracted, and it comes from probably specific genetic wiring. Um, and they're born that way. It's not a, it's not like a moral decision, you know. It's not like it basically is. You're either same-sex attracted or you're opposite-sex attracted, and biologically that's the way you are. So there is nothing that uh, so so is it kind of like a, a Russian roulette uh, 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 scenario where uh, you know there, there there's nothing really environmentally that uh, uh, triggers this. It's, it's, it's well, yes, biological. I mean, if you think so, so a lot of things that happen in our environment can actually. Um, have part of our genetic wiring come out. Let me give you an example of something that's called what's called perfect pitch. It's, a, it's an example in a different area. So perfect pitch, there's, there's about maybe 5 6 7% of the population that has the genetic wiring for perfect pitch musically. But it only comes out if you get musical training before the age of 7 years mm. old. So you can see the environment. The environment elicits this genetic wiring in those people with perfect pitch. But if you don't, okay. if you didn't get the musical training by age seven, even though you have the genetic wiring, it won't come out. Do you know what I mean? So, so I guess that um, let's say your brain is wired to be same-sex attracted. 
Mm-hmm. And but you never really ever in your life had the opportunity for, for that. It was never elicited in any way. You know, you might you might grow up and um, you might or might not end up with somebody of the opposite sex, depending on what culture you're in. You know, there there were you know for eons they married off gay males to to straight women in many cultures. That's just how that's the only opportunity there was. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so there's, it's it's the environment does the environment does matter, and I think you know lots of high schools today are. Are, are very much more um, accepting and and helpful to that coming out process as the development of the teen brain unfolds. If you're mm-hmm. gonna be, if you're going to be same sex attracted, that's when it will happen. Is in puberty, just like it's happening for the opposite sex attracted teenagers. So, you know, I think it's it's allowing for people's natural natural brain wiring to come out and unfold and you know to be able to accept all of our citizens and for equal rights in sure. this world. Finally California is getting with the program, at least mm-hmm. <laughs> at least part of California. So but it's it's all you know, it's allowing the part of the natural brain wiring to come out. Now uh this is absolutely fascinating, Doc. Um uh, so I'm going to throw one more at you, and uh, that is uh, looking at um, uh, someone who's, who's famous, but this is something that is uh, a remarkably growing uh, trend, especially in the area where you live in San Francisco. Uh, we look at, cha- uh, you know, Chastity Bono changing over to Chaz Bono. How does yeah, Chaz- Say that again, Chastity what? Chastity uh, Bono. Changing over to Chaz, right? So, no. uh, so what do you call that? Trans, uh, transgender. How does that? How does that change hormonally when someone feels that they have been, uh, they're, they're born uh, a woman, but they they feel like they are, are a male in a woman's body, or vice versa? Right, and you know that happens often. It's it's, it's very rare, of course. You know, but it happens at a very young age. Um, there's a lovely program on 2020 that Barbara Walters did a number of years ago, and looking at at um, I think there were twin boys that were born. One of them did all the boy things. The other one though liked to dress in girls' clothes and really thought he was insisted that he was a girl, mm-hmm. and um, had a what's called a was, was the gender identity of that child was female, so the brain was a female brain in a male body, and those things of course can happen or a male brain in a female body. And, you know, only since modern science and medicine have been able to do something about that um, have we been able to help people transition from a body that may have been the wrong body since the brain in that body is of the opposite sex. So that um, that is happening more and more and um I have I have several of my students at uh, UCSF who basically have made the transition already. I know one of one of my one of my male students who had been born female, he transitioned over and you know they give you the testosterone and it takes a lot a lot of years to transition over. And uh the he says the only sad thing is is that as he got more testosterone he got into his adult years and tr- transitioning to male, he also went he went bald. <laughs> <laughs> And as a girl, when he was younger, he used to have a wonderful head of hair. So. <laughs> you know, this is absolutely fascinating, and I uh, am just honored that you brought this uh, level of research uh, to the celebrity level so that, you know, uh, uh, people can really you know, get a chance to uh, uh, read about this in in a, in a format that that's befitting of, of a lay person, and, and and so I just honor you for that. I think you're absolutely fantastic. Well, thanks so much for having me. And any of your listeners who want to come over to San Jose on the March 17th, 18th weekend can come to San Jose to the to the I Can Do It Ignite uh, conference. Yeah, talk to me about that. This is Hay House, correct? That's Hay House, yeah, and it's in, in San Jose. It's the it's the uh, it's it's it's, it's the I Can Do it ignite conference and um i'll be there speaking there on the sunday so have people come and they can come ask me their own questions and uh, we can have a chat more in depth about some of these issues that that you and i just started to scratch the surface of 
Absolutely. Anything new? Can we, uh, is there another book coming out? Something new? What's well, I'm in working the, on the, the, the working on the love brain, but the, the male and female brain in love. <laughs> that that's that's uh, that's a trifecta right there. I'm loving it. <laughs> there, there you go. So thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to such an intelligent gentleman who has lots of the, of the best questions I've ever had on a radio show. <laughs> <laughs> I received that, and I'm honored by it, and honored by you. Uh, only one thing, I would love to have you come back later on when your book comes out and have you back on the show. Okay. Well, in, in the meantime, enjoy the female brain, page 39. That's for you. <laughs> page 39. I'm going there right now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for being uh, for being on the show, uh, Dr. Brindenheim. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, go out, get this book. Uh, reread the book if it's, if it's on your bookshelf, and uh, make sure you go see her live. Uh, in San Jose. What are the dates again, Doc? March March 18th. March 18th, San Jose. Go do it. Make it happen. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. You know, you're watching the Philippe Matthews shows. Now, let me just give you my opinion. He is the Oprah of Internet. What that means is that he is getting together the biggest audience of people that want to make a difference in the world. And if that's you, you keep watching.